Listen to the 48 Hours podcast for shocking murder cases and compelling real-life dramas from one of television's most watched true crime shows. Go behind the scenes of each episode with award-winning CBS News correspondents and producers in Postmortem, a weekly deep dive. Listen to 48 Hours wherever you get your podcasts. Girl, real talk. This whole, it's a new year, time to reinvent myself trash is not the vibe for 2024. You can find someone who loves you for you, as you are. You don't need to read a stack of self-help books, only eat sad salads, or like start meditating at 5 a.m. to be ready for dating. So yeah, my advice is to download Bumble and find someone who embraces you the way you are right now. Let me know how it goes. A note to listeners, the following podcast contains content that may not be suitable for all audiences. Discretion is advised. And I actually got a couple emails anonymously from some deputies that said, hey, this department's crooked. He had taken a freezer to the net property. So I've I've heard body locations on multiple occasions. She told her uncle when he would get drunk and high and stuff in the evening, he would start talking about Molly. Had somebody who was in jail at the same time somebody else was in jail that had talked about it kind of ran in that same crew of criminals that was going on over there that were talking in jail about all the locations that they said they'd taken Molly's remains. Rob told her that she is buried and concrete was poured over the top of her. They should do a grand jury. You are listening to Partners in True Crime. We are your hosts, Rob and Cindy Dorfman. This week, we have some news out of Love County. What happened? Well, it's very upsetting. The new sheriff in Love County, Marty Grisham, who has been really, really, really proactive in trying to solve this case. For the past two years, he's been working diligently with another investigator in trying to figure out what exactly happened. Unfortunately, he passed away this week. So it's um, upsetting because he really was adamant that he wanted to solve this case and he wanted to get justice for the family. And that was his main mission. As sheriff. He actually brought in a new investigator, not affiliated with Love County, and we're going to talk to him in another episode. He will reveal what Marty's plan was to try to find the killers for Molly and Colt, and he really did a thorough job. We feel bad that he wasn't able to finish the job. I just wish we knew what it was he died of. And also to send condolences to his family and his friends because he was a very nice man and really actually wanted to help. This week, Paula has decided to come and tell us new information that we've never heard before. And it's quite shocking. There's a lot of theories that have been going around and we've heard a myriad of them. And I think she's going to give us another theory from something that she's heard through the grapevine. and Also something that happened in the first week of the investigation, which we did not know until recently. We're just going to call Paula now. One of the first people that Con Nip called the morning of the 8th was Rob Branch. And he's Con's cousin. Rob is also the same person that Alex Miller and Michael Miller and Judge Hogan had gone and talked to the week that Molly disappeared. Because they had heard that Molly had been over there. So they went to his house and spoke to him. And he stated that. He had taken a freezer out to the net property. What kind of freezer? Well, I don't know if it was an upright freezer or a chest-type freezer, but it was a freezer. Did he say what it was for? No. No, he didn't tell them. When I questioned Alex about that time frame, I wanted to know a time frame that him and Michael and 
and Donnie had gone over to Rob Branch's house, I said, what day of the week was that? Do you recall? And he says he thought it was that Friday after Molly went missing on Monday. He thinks it was that following Friday that they went out there and Rob told him that he had taken a freezer. I don't recall who asked him for the freezer, whether it be Colby or Con, but one of them had asked him to bring the freezer out there and he did. Did he often do stuff like this for Con and Colby before? Like, did, was he a kind of guy that would normally do run errands for them and do stuff for them? You know, I, I honestly don't know if he had or not. When was the freezer delivered? Earlier that week. So okay. sometime after men, between Monday and Friday, Alex said it was about Friday that they went to Rob Branch's house and spoke to him. So, and he had stated earlier in the week, he had taken a freezer out there. Yeah. So was he ever questioned by the police, Rob Branch? Ronnie Hampton did go question him and his family. His grandparents lived next door a little ways down the road, did question and talk to them, I believe it was an aunt of Rob Branches, told Ronnie, I need to speak to you out on the porch, and took him out on the porch. And I, I'm, I'm sure there's probably a, a statement to this effect in his in his stuff, but took him outside and told him something happened down there at Rob Branch's house. Okay. Even some in his family believe that he there's some sort of involvement with Rob. And now the, the daughter of Rob that nobody seemed to know about, even Wilson and I said, I've talked to and asked about this daughter. They had no idea Rob Branch had a daughter. She's now 17 years old. She is being raised by her uncle on her mom's side. Her mom's in prison. She's 17 now, and she started acting out and stuff. The girl lives in Fort Worth with her uncle. So she was nine when Molly went missing, but... Anyway, they were having problems with her, and they had heard that Rob was doing well, so they called him up, asked him if he would take her for a while and see if he couldn't straighten her out. Well, that was a mistake. Rob abused her sexually, from what she says, and mentally and physically was abusing her, and they've got pictures of the physical abuse. But she told her uncle when he would get drunk and high and stuff in the evening, he would start talking about Molly, but she did say that. Rob told her that she is buried and concrete was poured over the top of her concrete slab. The uncle, when I first spoke to him, told me that some sort of building was erected on top of this concrete slab and she's buried underneath it. And I asked him, I said, did she mention anything about a dog pen? And he said she didn't, but he said, when I get back home, I'll ask. He had only spoke to her the night before. She had just come back from Rob's. Recap here. So she she told the person that she heard that Molly was buried in concrete and a structure is on top of her. And right. you said you think there's said something about a dog pen? One of the tips that we got in the beginning was that they buried her. They put a concrete slab on top of her and put the dog pen, built the dog pen on top of that. It's behind John Nip's house. So it's on the Nip property. Mm-hmm. So the FBI and the OSBI got this got the tip as well back in 2014, and they went out there on this tip, and they did let them go back there. They just looked around the dog pen. They didn't do anything with the cement slab or didn't take any equipment or anything of that nature. I recall Justin Brown calling me after the fact and telling me, well, we went and checked it out. I said, did you jackhammer that concrete up? And he was like, no, Paula, we can't go on people's property and start destroying their property. We're going to go back with ground penetrating equipment. I'm like, great. Never happened. They never went back with the ground penetrating radar? No, okay. never. Did they tell you why they didn't? No. They just never followed through. They never vet out a, a tip from start to finish. And that is OSBI? Mm-hmm. Okay, so then to circle back to where we are now, so Rob Branch, one of the people that was one of the last people to be with Molly, his daughter has recently said that Molly comes up in conversation when her father, Rob Branch, is drunk or doing drugs, and she has now mm -hmm. told her uncle that he was rambling on about how Molly was buried under the cement slab that you got a tip on in the days following her disappearance. Is that correct? Yeah. 
How how soon after her disappearance did this happen? Did we get this tip? Yeah. Yes. I don't know the exact date, but I can tell you that on, I think it was September the 1st of 2013 is when me and Mandy and Misty went to Connip's house asking the grandpa if we could go back there and look at the dog pen because we had already gotten that tip. Mm-hmm. So we're talking in like three months, three months within after. three months of. Yeah, within three months after her disappearance, we'd already had this information. Could they tell that the cement recent? Could they at least, I mean, because you usually could tell that if it's only three months. How long was it from the time that Molly went missing, the OSBI went out there to look? Oh, that was over a year. Okay. Over a year. So it was three months after. Three months after it happened, you guys were there, but they wouldn't let you in the back to look at the pen, correct? Right. And then a year later is when the OSBI went out there and said they couldn't find anything or that they were going to go back with ground penetrating equipment and they did not. Right. Okay. So now we circle back to this young woman now that you've been trying to get OSBI to speak to, Rob Branch's daughter, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they haven't done that yet. Right. And have they formally questioned Rob Branch? No. OSBI has not. Okay. Just just, uh, the state troopers did. Yeah. But now that the FBI is supposedly involved in this, do you have an FBI point contact person or no? Yes. Has that person done any of this? No. Okay. And what is the status and what are they telling you based upon this all this information? Because you have mountains of information here to go through and it all kind of points back into the same direction. And so what are they telling you? Well, the FBI is not really saying anything. I do know a state senator contacted the FBI yesterday in regards to Molly's case. There is a possibility that Rob Branch brought a freezer over to the NIPS, as he told Alex and the other Miller family members within a week of Molly disappearing. And that freezer was used to transport Molly and potentially Colt's body. Is that a theory? Yes. Okay. And we have obviously yeah. multiple theories. Yeah. We're looking at the dog kennels where the cement was, which wasn't formally searched. It was just walked by. At least I know from all the Law enforcement shows that I've done and worked with investigators, when they get a hot tip, they usually jump on it. They usually mm-hmm. jump on it f- fairly fast. Paula, you're not a crazy person, okay? If anything, you, you're making them crazy because you're bringing logic and you're doing the investigation that should be done. You're talking to the people that need to be talked to. You're pounding the pavement. They're not pounding the pavement. They're reacting to whatever you're telling them. It's strange. It's baffling. Molly Miller was Chickasaw, and Love County is in the Chickasaw Nation. Yeah, most of Oklahoma is Indian Territory, and today we're really lucky to have this amazing guest speak to us. Her name is Darcy Schoon. She's a private investigator. She works very closely with Native American uh, indigenous missing persons cases and also been working closely with Paula on trying to find different strategies to bring more focus and attention, federal attention, to Molly's case. So we're really excited to have her. Let's call her. Hello. Hello, this is Darcy. Hi, Darcy. It's Cindy Dorfman. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Good. Thanks so much for taking the call today. I wanted to first start with you and what's your background and what you do for a living so we can understand what your role in all of this is. Years ago, I had a good friend that badgered me into helping with some missing kids that he was working on. And I just finally acquiesced. And I started looking at it and I realized what a dire need in this country to resolve missing persons cases. I kind of got involved in that and everything changed. So instead, I opened up a private investigation business missing person policy and reform is needed desperately everywhere. But when my own people are struggling as much as they are, we need advocates inside of it. And so I've really just made this natural transition to helping with indigenous missing persons cases. Are you Native American then? I am Caddo. I am a citizen of the Caddo Nation. Yeah. Just curious on on how you got involved with the case and what your thoughts are about it. The time that Molly was missing, I'm really well known for working in juvenile missing persons cases. And so I had a juvenile case. It was a really big, it was all over the news and lots of high profile response to that case. And I think people just 
got it and views. He knew that I was working on a big case and then Molly was in the news a lot too. So I think they just kind of intermixed their signals. And so I started getting the tips coming in and didn't want to let those tips fall to the wayside. So I, that's how I, I really started talking to Paula. I started calling her. I was like, hey, getting some tips. Let me know how you want them. And I just want to make sure you get them. People call me and if I felt like they weren't going to call me again, or I would just try and take the contact information and then get it back to Paula. I know how important it is to have everything that comes in and have information. What were some of the things you were hearing? I've heard body locations on multiple occasions. And I had somebody who was in jail at the same time somebody else was in jail. Kind of ran in a crew of criminals that was going on over there that was talking in jail about all the locations that they said they'd taken Molly's remains. And I think those were all rumors that they'd heard before. I I can't be for sure because I... I didn't personally hunt down anything that was given to me. I just took it and, you know, gave it to Paula. And then I actually got a couple emails anonymously from some deputies that said, hey, this department's crooked. Can you please, if you have anything you can help me with, can you please? And that was a long, long time ago. That was probably three to four months after she went missing. I said, I actually got some emails from some deputies who said, please intervene if you can. And this was about Love County? Yeah, it was about Love County. And specifically Molly. They're like, this deputy is they're criminals. They're involved in all kinds of crime themselves and don't trust anybody down here. Wow. That's scary. So, yeah, it was worded in the email was, hey, I work at Love County Sheriff's Department. Please be careful and please don't tell them that I gave you this. But I, I mean, there wasn't a name on it. The fact is I had deputies that were scared to say anything internally. Girl, real talk. This whole, it's a new year, time to reinvent myself trash is not the vibe for 2024. You can find someone who loves you for you, as you are. You don't need to read a stack of self-help books, only eat sad salads, or like start meditating at 5 a.m. to be ready for dating. So yeah, my advice is to download Bumble and find someone who embraces you the way you are right now. Let me know how it goes. Inspired by the life of the savvy and ambitious Colombian businesswoman Griselda Blanco comes a new Netflix original limited series. Griselda tells the story of a devoted mother who, with her lethal blend of charm and relentless savagery, creates one of the most powerful cartels in history. Witness Sofia Vergara's captivating transformation into the godmother of the underworld. Griselda, streaming January 25th, only on Netflix. When you heard about Molly's case, what did you think? Oh, I thought it was a homicide pretty quickly. Why? Well, it didn't make sense the way that it was the had a car, high speed pursuit. It ended somewhere randomly in the middle of nowhere. One person comes back and two people don't. That's never a good indication when you get one person back and two people you don't get back. And the thing is, is if you're familiar with rural Oklahoma, which I am, I, I live in rural Oklahoma. If you're familiar with it, then people who live there know every nook and cranny, every space, every rock. Like they use them for directions. Go down this road till you see the rock on the left. That's really how directions are given in rural Oklahoma. So to tell me that no one could find them when I know that family has been living there in statehood, and they know every nook and cranny of their property. I just, I found it implausible. It doesn't sound right. It never has for us either. It just doesn't make sense. And so here in Oklahoma, the big thing that's going on right now that's impacting so many missing persons cases is the McGirt ruling that's happened. Can you tell me a little bit about what the McGirt law is? McGirt is a person, it's the last name of a person, but he challenged the state of Oklahoma's jurisdiction to convict him in a criminal act. And that challenge went all the way to the Supreme Court. And what the case said was that approximately half of the state of Oklahoma was still Indian territory. It was still a reservation and Congress had never disestablished half of the state as an embryo reservation. So the state of Oklahoma, because he was a Native American and the crime was committed on that half of the state, they did not have jurisdiction to convict him. And he won that case. And so 
the Supreme Court said that Congress never disestablished the eastern portion of Oklahoma as a reservation, state government does not have the jurisdiction to work any criminal cases against you or for you as a perpetrator or Native American as a victim to the federal jurisdiction kicks in. It depends. Okay, so there's something called the Major Crimes Act. You are a Native American and you've committed a crime under the Federal Crimes Major Crime Act, which is murder, homicide, sex trafficking, strangulation, a major crime. Then the only person that can take it to court is the FBI based, the DOJ, has to be a federal entity. And if you have committed a crime that is not a major crime, then whatever tribe controls that area has to take you to court and charge you. The way that M- McGirt impacted missing persons cases, missing persons cases, you look at two people, you look at the person who created the missing person episode and whether or not they acted illegally and criminally. And then you look at the person who's actually missing. Missing people most often are not criminal. They're actually victims of a crime. So there's a different law. If you are a victim of a crime in Indian country, then it is also federal jurisdiction. And it doesn't matter who committed a crime. So if you're a person who is missing from Indian country, then tribal police and your and your and your native and tribal police have to do the missing persons report. But the issue becomes who picks that case up if it's a murder? Well it has to be federal jurisdiction. So the feds have to pick it up. But so many missing persons cases are stuck in this weird limbo. So if you're a missing person, that case is not a criminal case. Like with the, the police come out, they take a report. That's not a criminal report, right? Right. So there's nothing for them to investigate. So the, the case just sits there and there's no work done on it unless there's something at the scene that indicates a crime has occurred. You know, blood everywhere, video of somebody getting drugs somewhere, witnesses, something happened. You have all these county sheriffs and local entities on the eastern side of the state that have these missing indigenous persons cases that could possibly be homicides that were never investigated, that the feds don't have jurisdiction to pick up because it's not a major crime. So it's just kind of stuck there in limbo with no one investigating it and no real transition from this missing person to, hey, we have a missing person to the feds because the feds don't take missing persons cases generally not a major crime you think that's what happened with molly well molly's been missing much longer than the mcgirt decision has had the ruling when did the mcgirt law come into play that was last year how has that changed molly's case she is a citizen of a, a tribe because she is a victim of a homicide I don't know if they're saying that publicly, but I do know that is the general understanding is she's a victim of homicide because she is a victim of homicide and because she's Native American. It is going to be the Eastern District of Oklahoma who has to file charges on that. And they haven't done that yet. They haven't done that. You know, I I talked to Paula, I want to say it was about three months ago to ask her about McGirt and whether or not it had been transitioned at this point. And I don't think she was familiar with it. And so we had some talk about it and I just said, you know, you need to kind of get in contact with the Eastern district and find out what they're doing on that. Now, whether they have or not, I don't know, but that is definitely something that needs to happen. Someone needs to sit down with the USADA and ask them, is this enough evidence to file charges? There's been so many things that happened with Molly. And I would say that had it not been for Oklahoma Highway Patrol and the FBI stepping in where they could get jurisdiction, we wouldn't have seen any movement on Molly's case. And, you know, now we're at the point that someone needs to help the feds connect the dots on Molly's case. Can you explain how the McGirt Law can help Molly's case? So the McGirt Law brings in federal resources and it brings in so much extra manpower. And then the other thing is that that area that 
Molly went missing from is very small. I don't know how many people Wilson, Oklahoma has in it, but I really think it's a less than a thousand. And so when you're dealing with people who live in a community and who are investigating that community and everyone knows where everybody lives, you, you can't hide from that. So there's no safety, especially given the fact that they there's been a lot of rumors about law enforcement being involved. And whether that's true or not, what we do know is that the sheriff of the county was convicted for crimes engaging himself in methamphetamine criminal activity during this time. So clearly you're not safe. You don't feel safe to go anywhere. And if you're working for the sheriff who's running it, I think they, they I think they convicted him of running a house of ill repute. So he's convicted of this. Who do you go to? So you only have like Wilson PD maybe has two police officers. The county has limited numbers of deputies at any given time. Who are you going to go to? So the FBI involvement here, I think, is crucial just in it brings in, it has the capability of bringing in a, a neutral third party who can really look at things with a fresh set of eyes. And I see a lot of agencies. I work with a lot of agencies. I see a lot of agencies work. And I would say that when we're talking about training and interview and interview styles, it's definitely going to be the beds that have the greater ability as a whole. I mean, there could be one or two people independently who are really good at interviewing and interview processes, but the feds as a whole have better training on that in general. And they're better at making someone come to the confession table without you know, beating them up. They're really good at that process. So I think that alone really would bring something to the table that that hasn't been there before, someone really skilled at forensic interviewing. Do you think Molly just saw something she shouldn't have? So hard to say. Obviously, if you have law enforcement engaging in criminal behavior and you're with a relative of the law enforcement person in the county, it, it would be easy to see something you weren't supposed to see. But then on the same token, you also have people who are using methamphetamine. So anytime you have the involvement of methamphetamine, had people that were killed for $100 in their wallet. There's so much mistrust and craziness that goes on inside uh, the meth communities. You can come up with all kinds of stuff, and it, it's really hard to, to say for sure. I think at the end of the day, Molly was very vulnerable, and she had a lot of adults around her that should have protected her. And I don't, I want to make sure there's been like accusations. There's been stuff that's gone in, in and out of the family. And so I want to make sure that I say that I'm not engaging in any of that discussion. What I'm saying is the people that she in the car with were five years older than her. You have people in this community that she was hanging out with socially that were adults that should have done a better job protecting her if they were going to let her stay there with them. Absolutely. I mean, they were all so, older than her, Colt and Con. They were. What did you know about the Nip family? So I haven't, other than all of the stuff that's been published about how they abused their position in the county using the sheriff as collateral, I just, you know, I haven't studied that, you know, too much into it other than knowing that particular thing happened. So, you know, I, I try not to, you know, it's really difficult. Can you bring us up to speed on some of the theories going around right now or progress that's been made or new evidence or anything that's happening that i don't know what all paula has disclosed i know that there's stuff that we talked about that you know maybe we could follow up with and then i could you know maybe help do some searching but you know right now for molly the most important thing is remain recovery if we can do remain recovery i think you'll see a rest and benefits for accessory after the fact and not actually the homicide, I think you're going to see some arrests at that, that particular point. But even um, without Remain Recovery, and I know that on other cases that I've been involved in, that there have been times when they've been able to make an arrest or to be able to create a scenario that leads to an arrest without it. Do you think that that's possible in this case? Yeah, I do. Because here's the thing is if you have a witness comes forward and 
remain recovery happens, it's going to substantiate one of the rumors. And not just that, depending on how much remains are left, the remains will substantiate a story. When we talk about remain recovery, it's not just because we think that it's resolution or whatever. It's actually going to solidify someone's story. Best case scenario for Molly's case, what is your opinion? They just start from ground zero and start interviewing people again. I think that best case scenario is that they redo all the interviews. Because right now, the information powerhouse in this case has been Paula. And that that's good in the aspect that information wasn't lost because if Paula wasn't doing it, the information would have been lost. Information powerhouse is Paula. You need the feds to be the information powerhouse and have all the same information so that they can move forward. And I think if you sit and talk to Paula and you go through all her information, you have enough information to move forward, but they just don't have it and done it, which is why I think a meeting with the USADA would be incredibly beneficial. Yeah, I think you, you're you right about that. Do you have any theories about what you think might have happened to Molly? Other than being a victim of homicide, I am frequently worried that she was sexually assaulted. And that really bothers me. Whatever happened, I don't think was without violence. I don't think it was accidental. I think she was vulnerable and she was victimized to the degree that they could victimize her. And that is really hurtful for the family and it's hurtful for me to say, but I am concerned that she suffered a a lot of things that we should never have to suffer ever in our life, but in particular at 17 years old. Yeah, that's such a tragedy. And it's just so upsetting that there's still no resolution for it at this point. It does. It's upsetting that there's as much information available and it hasn't moved forward. No, it hasn't moved forward at all. I mean, that's the thing that's... You know, they could have done a grand jury. This is another option for the feds. And this is why I'm saying Paula shouldn't have to be the information powerhouse. They should be the information powerhouse. They should do a grand jury, present the information to a grand jury and see if the grand jury will charge. And if the jury grand jury comes back and says, you can charge these people with these things, this is what I believe, they could move forward on it. But it, to my knowledge, no grand jury has happened. And yeah. why but, haven't they done that? Well, because McGirt just happened. So in the in the beginning, the feds didn't have... A, now, the state could have done a grand jury inquisition, but they did not. But I'm kind of glad they didn't in this particular case because the files would have been sealed and there's an evidentiary rule that would have prevented the state from passing on sealed files, evidentiary files to the feds. I, I think the feds should do... They should at least do a grand jury inquisition because it forces people who know information to either perjure themselves or be in contempt of court. So if you have people that know information and you put them in front of a grand jury and they refuse to answer questions, they can put them in jail. And that, and that's really what needs to happen is the type of that type of pressure needs to be happening. You think people are out there that know exactly what happened? I definitely think there's people out there that know what was going on. Absolutely. I mean, at this point, you would think that they would have the conscience to say, look, this is what happened. I can't carry this with me anymore. I don't understand how people can keep that a secret for this long. Yeah, well, I think they use, you know, usually they use more and more meth to kind of cope with that kind of stuff, which is another issue. You know, you have people who start to lose memory because of substance abuse. So, and that is a, that is a problem. That is a very big problem with prosecution of homicides with methamphetamine users involved. If you've never had to go interview a bunch of methamphetamine users about a homicide, it's mind boggling the information like I've had women tell me one time that the suspect had a bunch of bucket of worms and snakes in their vehicle that they made him drive around with and crazy stories that don't make sense. And then when you find the person and you look in their vehicle, it's like a bucket of uh, garden hoses and stuff. You can't be put, put people on a stand and they are telling you that it's a bucket of snakes and like have a solid prosecution. That's an issue that probably is going to impact what's going on with Molly. Yeah, it seems to always have been the issue from the beginning that there were drugs involved, heavy drugs involved, meth was involved. We've spoken to a few different people who say that there's someone involved that's scarier than the people we think it is. Yeah. Do you do you think that that's a possibility? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I think that's a real possibility and then the people who meth fog based on my unscientific interviewing of people who have been on meth, uh, it takes about 30 days to cure meth fog. Uh, 
I, I sign that if I wait 30 days, I get really good interviews. But the and they're ready flows because they have all this guilt and shame from whatever happened during the time they were using meth. So usually about a 30 day mark, I try to do interviews if like they've been in jail or whatever. And when they disclose this information, one of the things they're acutely aware of is if they were to get back in the community, there's a, a serious danger of relapse. And then they're acutely aware of how dangerous the people they were around have become. So I think for someone who's come out of that and is a little more sober and they're trying to get their life on track, going through the trial for a homicide investigation seems probably daunting. Self-preservation helps them remain silent. That's been my experience anyway. I would imagine. I mean, they're on meth. You can't even have a conversation with them. When I went there, I mean, I didn't realize how prevalent meth was. I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah. It's bad. It's a big problem in that state. Yes, it is. And it amazes me. You have people in these mess circles. They sleep with each other. They like share like the boyfriends and girlfriends. They go back and they have no self-care. What's, you know, healthy or unhealthy. It's mind boggling to me. Some of the things that they do to themselves in the desire to use meth. So, Cindy, I didn't want to tell you this while we were doing the interview, but we got a message from our website that we have a tip, and I don't know what it's about. Oh, my God. Who's it from? I don't know, but we're going to check it out. You and I are going to hopefully get set up a talk with this person. Hopefully, we can get them to come on the show. You're going to hear it next time. Hopefully, it's going to help us. Next time on Partners in True Crime. Elected officials, you people that get paychecks from the people, figure it out. Bullshit went on long enough. These families need peace and solace. I'd hate to say what Joe Russell knows. I'd hate to say it. I've known Joe Russell all of my life, and he's a piece of shit. They, at first, they said a little con nip. You know, they wanted to say that, that they thought that he's the one that killed him, but he didn't kill him. Uh, the boy that won't talk, that boy will talk to me. Colby's lucky he's alive today. I was told that he was the one that killed Molly, you know, and there was a knife and a, they had a gun and this and that. Our team was the one that found the gun. If you or anyone you know is suffering from a methamphetamine addiction, please contact the American Meth Addiction Hotline. If you or anyone you know has been the victim of sexual abuse, please contact the National Domestic Violence Hotline. For any tips relating to the disappearance of Molly Miller and Colt Haynes, please contact 833-4-MOLLY and Colt, and they will be directed to the proper law enforcement agency. All rights reserved. This has been a production of 722 Media Content. Please check out our website, where you'll find supplemental material and Vi's original song, Take Me Back, written for Molly Miller.